Welcome, everybody, to Elevated Culture, brought to you by The Clinic. This is our eighth episode, and we have a very special guest, as we were teasing uh, last episode and possibly the episode before. Um, As you know, we've been on our new marketing campaign, uh, which has been to elevate your senses. And in the month of July, which we are on the tail end of, we are talking about the sense of hearing um, and, and kind of what that means, having your voice be heard, uh, being, being a part of something um, and, and getting out there and where the cannabis industry is today. And that is something that uh, we're going to talk about a little further, but I would be remiss if I didn't introduce uh, my co-host and good friend to the left of me here, Mr. Ryan Cook. How are you, my friend? I, uh, I can't complain. I'm rested. I uh, was out in Tahoe last, last week. Beautiful. Yeah. So, uh, was there any Tahoe OG out there? You know, uh, one of the things that I actually thought was amazing out there is that uh, if you know about, uh, I guess I'm going to kind of sell these guys out, but I I'd sort of <laughs> sort of have to because I don't know how else to, to say this story. But uh, New Leaf, um, which is uh, right there nestled into the uh, the lake area, awesome store. Um, definitely suggest that if you're in the Tahoe area, go there. Uh, but they had on their menu the bank. From Colorado, they are selling Fluffhead uh, nice. while uh, while Fish was in town playing. And so um, pretty amazing. But I, I went there and uh, tried to get the Fluffhead. It was sold out. She said it was too awesome. Sold really quickly. But um, but, uh, but definitely got a little inquisitive as to how is it that you guys are selling the bank's genetics uh, in California? And she said, well, that's actually impossible because that would be illegal. Um, but, and so Bud Tender Fair did enough. an amazing job. She did awesome. Um, <laughs> but uh, I can tell you that it's on your website. Uh, so <laughs> I'd take a peek at that, but, uh, either way, awesome store, go check out New Leaf, <laughs> uh, and love Tahoe. So, uh, well, welcome back. Thanks we're, a lot. We're glad thanks to have a lot. You. And, uh, gl- glad to be on, uh, episode eight here. Yeah. Episode eight, as I said, you know, we're talking about, you know, the sense of hearing and I think we have an amazing guest here today um, when you're talking about the sense of hearing someone who has not only had his voice uh, be able to be heard, um, but also has given an outlet to to so many others. I mean, uh, you've had, what, more than two decades uh, in journalism. Um, you were the first cannabis uh, editor uh, with The Cannabis. Um, you know, you were the subject of the documentary Rolling Papers when recreational adult use cannabis came into play in Colorado um, and how you were covering that. Um, you have moved on to uh, so many other things, and we're going to get to those in a second. Um, but no, uh, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, I could. Like this is your life. Yeah, this is your life. Yeah, yeah. I could keep going. Um, we but, have a couple of uh, individuals that we're going to bring in from your past. Oh, uh, yeah. I hope some ex-girlfriends, some old like a, editors. Yeah, it's like a Maury show. Um, but Ricardo Baca, everyone. Oh, yeah, man. thank you so much for being. Hey, here. thank you guys for ha- letting me join. I am super jazzed to be a part of Elevated Culture here at the clinic. Big longtime fan and friend of both of yours, and it's good to be here. Well, we appreciate you being here, so thank you so, so much. Um, I think we kind of want to start off. I know a lot of people know your name. Um, a, a lot of people know what you were doing with the cannabis, but do you want to give us kind of a quick background um, as to how you got into journalism and, and you know, where it led you, you know, and and kind of how you got to where you are today. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, I've always been a fan of jur- uh, of journalism. I remember delivering the Rocky Mountain News RIP, you know, uh, to suburban neighborhoods all across Westminster back in the day when I wasn't even old enough to, you know, clear dishes at the, at the diner down the street, which is where I went when I turned 15. But, <laughs> you know, I just, I've always loved, uh, you know, newsprint, um, admired and appreciated the fourth estate, um, the ability for journalists to hold the powerful accountable in industry, in government, and everywhere. And so, you know, I kind of stumbled into it, uh, journalism via a college scholarship, but I was very thankful for it. And, 
next thing you know, uh, after the Rocky and a quick move to Texas, I ended up back in Denver at the Denver Post and wrote about music there. And and years and years later, uh, you know, on the precipice of recreational cannabis being implemented in Colorado in late 2013, the editor of the Post took me out to lunch and said, hey, I want you to head up our coverage of cannabis I want to cover this differently than it's ever been covered by a mainstream outlet before. I want to have some fun with it. I want, I want to be realistic with it. And, and I think you're the right guy to do this. Um, and when I asked him why, you know, cause I was like, you know, there's far bigger potheads in the newsroom than I am. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but you, you started this music festival, you started this music blog, you you have this drive to create, and you've also been a reporter and a critic and an editor. And I trust you to be able to do this. And so December of 2013, we launched a site called the cannabis and it had never existed before. It was, it was kind of scary. Um, but thanks to some good media and, and, and a lot of great, um, people believing in us, uh, we developed a readership and ultimately um, created the cannabis into a site that was beating high times and marijuana.com and in digital monthly uniques. And so that was my entry into this crazy world. And, and, and life's been a roller coaster ever since a really fun roller coaster, I will add. I can only imagine. I can only imagine seeing, you know, where you started, where you've been, and now where you are right now uh, with Grasslands. Do you want to talk about Grasslands for, yeah. for a minute and kind of let everyone know? You know, know what, though? I, I have a question for you <laughs> before you even go there. Let's I mean, it. honestly, well, it. It, in the newsroom, I mean, like, if, if they came up and, and tap you on the shoulder, so obviously you need to do your shirt laundry. Uh, they, they, <laughs> they know what's going on. Right. I mean, how, how uh, I mean, was that, was that cool at the post at that time? I'm mean, could you, uh, could you be outed as a, a, a cannabis, a, a cannabis guy? You know, it wasn't cool. It was kind of, you know, it, I mean, it was still like 2013. So a lot has changed since then, but you know, I think they, they just knew that I was familiar with it because I'd been their music critic for more than 12, 13 years by that point. Um, but I, but at the same time, I do remember looking them in the eye that a day later when I was like, you know, I want this job, you know, I'm going to accept this job. I just need protection because technically if I start this site and where I'm talking about my own consumption and I start this talk show, like you wanted me to, you know, I had a podcast years ago that Ryan was a guest on and, and some of your other colleagues, um, and I just told them I didn't want to do this unless I could be very open and honest about my own consumption and my feelings about what was happening. And and they made me a promise that I would never uh, be fired on drug related, cannabis related um, instances unless I was like obviously consuming during work hours. And, you know, I, I just wasn't doing that. And and I was appreciative of that. And eventually we, we got them to expand that protection around others who are in my circle of staff just because I really needed them to be able to be open, comfortable with that conversation as well. Because even a few years ago, this was a very different conversation in Colorado. I mean, let's be honest, legally in any employer in the state of Colorado or anywhere else can fire you based on your cannabis consumption. And that needs to change. It, it does need to change. And I, something you talked about earlier as you were getting into journalism and your intrigue into it, which was y you mentioned talking about the both sides, you know, of the equation and being able to present that to people um, and kind of that being an important part of it. Um, being, you know, a, a cannabis consumer, um, you know, activist or, you know, whatever, whatever terminology you want to put on it, but, but someone who is a proponent of it and, and someone who enjoys it. How hard is that uh, being an editor and not only managing yourself, but these other people, but the content that's, that's being put out? How do you kind of balance that tight wire, like walking that line? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, at the time, I very much considered myself a journalist. I was full time, you know, media being in that reporter position, you have to be as unbiased as possible, regardless of what you're reporting on. Um, and, and if somebody can ever come up to you and say, I've, I've looked at everything you've written in the last year, and it's clear you have a very pro cannabis or anti marijuana view, that's problematic. Um, and thankfully, well, I had plenty of accusations thrown at me saying I was in the prohibitionist's pocket or I was in the industry's pocket. You know, it was always pretty evened out. Um, I, I, I really took great pride in 
our um, coverage that held the industry to a higher standard, that held the industry to a very, very professional level over the years. Um, and I also am really proud of the work that we did that held the regulators to the same standards. You know, you think about these early years. I mean, Colorado was the first. You guys were the first uh, among the first licensees to do this and how complicated that really was in 2012, 13, 14. Um, you know, nobody knew what they were doing. <laughs> we were all figuring it out at the time. But but it was important to not only write the stories about the edibles manufacturers who were not making accurately dosed uh, products, or the uh, concentrates companies that were allowing uh, pesticides through the manufacturing process. And it was as important to do those stories as it was to, to do the ones where the regulators were being held accountable on, okay, here we are four or five years in, why are we not, why do we, why do, why do we not have any mandatory pesticide testing as is written in the original regs that you wrote in 2013? And so, um, you know, that was, ma that was massively important to me. A fun part about that was I was working with a staff, many of whom are freelancers, many of whom are activists and advocates. And so it was fun to work with them, to teach them more about journalism, to teach them more about sourcing equally from both sides. And so I, I love educating and that was a good time. And of course, now that I'm no longer a full-time journalist, which we'll get into later, you know, it's uh, it's fun to kind of like step into those advocate shoes too, yep. take what I learned over the years and, and really apply that to intelligent advocacy on on behalf of sensible drug policies. I mean, it's, it's got to be a tough though deal though to be in, in the newsroom with everyone talking about a story. Hey, listen, someone just had a pesticide recall, uh, you know, whatever it might be, something something damaging to their organization, right? And you guys to say they're a pretty good sponsor. Um they they do put some ads in the paper. Does that does that conversation happen though? I mean, you're not you're no longer there. Oh, <laughs> the, man. the veil has dropped. I, uh, <laughs> I will tell all. Right. Yeah, yeah. I will tell all. When's the book coming out? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's the beauty of like working for a legitimate news organization. Yeah. Uh, because you're right; those conversations happen in alternative weeklies and, um, you know, consumer magazines, certainly websites all over. But newspapers are different. I mean, newspapers, I truly believe it's the last bastion of actual ethical reporting in this country. And sure, some of the television stations get it right. Some of the cable stations get it right. Uh, but if you want to find that, that top level journalism, you know, I think about the New York Times and the Washington Post. They're doing some of the best work in journalism in this country. And, and, but, you know, the Denver Post isn't that far behind. Sure, they don't have the resources. They don't have that budget. But but in terms of ethical integrity, they really do. And so, you know, we always call it, it's a separation between church and state. Uh, editorials, church, advertising is state, and never the two shall cross, and never did they cross. Uh, certainly, I did have more than a few colleagues from the other side of the room or a different floor of the building come over and say, hey, you know, these guys are spending some money with us and I know you can't do anything, but would you be cool with like throwing them a review or, or hey, these guys are spending some money with us and they say that you just called them asking them for a, co a comment on this latest recall. And they knew damn well that wasn't going anywhere. They had to do that on behalf of their advertising cult client. And sure. I totally understood it, but we would have never done, we, we would have never changed anything. And I, and I can honestly say that in my 16 years at the Post and 20 plus years of daily journalism experience, I never catered or kowtowed to an advertiser once. Not once. That's awesome. And, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure it makes for some awkward parties, uh, yeah. but <laughs> but that's pretty amazing that you you you, uh, you guys have you know sort of rolled the line that way. You know what's fun is I actually have a story now, and I won't name names, but <laughs> I wrote something that was you know very true, um, but you know hardly complimentary to a Colorado cannabis business, and of course sought them out for comment ahead of time. And they chatted with me a little bit about what was going on before kind of falling off the map. And I totally understood. And we just had to meander our way around the rest of that story without them. Um, but years later, uh, they were looking for a an agency to handle their publicity and their marketing and their social and their digital and their content. And when my name was recommended to this person initially, he uh, he told our mutual friend, oh, hell no, not that guy. <laughs> but then he thought about it seriously for five seconds. And he said, wait a minute, give me his number. 
and and they are now a client of mine. So I think it did make for some awkward parties, industry parties, run-ins in the dispensary, certainly. But it was cool to see that that level of integrity can um, can shine and carry with you so that later on when you're not doing the full-time journalism thing and, and you're doing the communications agency thing yep. that it kind of shines and they're like, all right, maybe we do want to be affiliated with you. And, and that was one of the highest compliments I got. I think that's great. That's something, and that's something that you're doing with, with gl- grasslands right now. Yeah. Correct. And, and is that something different that you saw say in 2013, you know, when this was just starting, right. Um, and the climate now, you know, just five years later, the way people are looking at news and the way people are looking at what people have written years past and things like that. Um, do you carry that over into what you're doing now? Do you think about it? Or is it something that you just know you've been up and up and and, and doing it the proper way and you're not worried about it? Very much. I think if I'm using that specific example, I, w- I would just go back and say, you know, I wasn't seeking out to make anybody look bad. I was just looking to tell a story about something um, that a process that had been overlooked, you know, the supply chain back in the day, uh, especially for you guys know the concentrates game very well. I mean, especially for a lot of these concentrates companies in 2015 that didn't have their own cultivation facilities and they just had bags coming in on each side. And, you know, uh, that was that was really complex and something slipped through. And I, of course, I believe they meant well, but something happened and I was just reporting what happened. It was that simple. But I do think that the industry has grown up a lot in this time, to your point. Uh, you know, you look at back to, you know, uh, pre-medical being regulated back in 2009, 2010. I mean, that was a that forced a massive coming of age and maturation for for medical cannabis. Ryan, I know you remember that. Uh, it was uh, it was an interesting time period, that's for sure. And you <laughs> definitely had to make some some, uh, you know, as the, as they call them, gray area decisions. So, <laughs> sure. uh, you know, and, and thankfully we graduated beyond that. And. And it's fascinating now. I know you guys are spending time in California. I've been in California twice in the last week. And um, we can break a little bit of news on this podcast and tell the world that Grasslands is opening its first non-Denver office in in L.A. Congratulations. Here pretty soon. So, yeah, we're looking to hire. But spending a lot more time out there now, you know, gosh, how interesting is it watching a non-regulated giant, ginormous market try to become regulated, try to abide by these norms. Um, Whereas I think we had it a lot easier that we were going from regulated medical to regulated adult use. I, without a doubt. And I mean, I, it's it's been a challenge already for us. And I know Matthew can speak to this as well. But I mean, uh, to to work with groups that have been, um, you know, major players in the cannabis industry in California for all of these years and are now um, nervous. Right. I mean, there's some some real challenges that they have to get over to uh, get into the regulated market. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how, how California shakes out. No question. But I think there's also more and more of us who are also being involved, right? I mean, we're, we're working out there and working with a, 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 you know, pretty large group that, uh, um, that I think, you know, we can, we can ensure that from a metric standpoint and from an inventory tracking standpoint, um, that they're dialed in. I mean, these guys are a great business people and have obviously been running these companies for a long time. They need no help there. Um, yep. you know, they, they just need help understanding some of the, the caveats of, of the uh, regulated market that we've been working with for, you know, for quite some time now. I think one of the groups that you're going to see having the hardest time, in my opinion, is is the cultivators, you know, um, because they are family farms. They they are individual farms, you know, that sort of thing. And they may not be used to all the technology and tracking and all this data entry and things like that. I'm you know, I'm sure they've been tracking on their own, but there are much more stringent uh, rules and regulations that they're that they're having to get into. Um, And I think, you know, someone maybe and, and this is not a blanket statement on all cultivators at all. But it's, you know, I I think that someone who has maybe at least set up uh, their business and has employees and that sort of thing, it it might be a little easier for them to kind of fall into that. Whereas these cultivators who are so good at what they do, and you want them to continue doing that because they're growing amazing cannabis, um, you want them to continue to be able to grow amazing cannabis and kind of 
help bridge that gap if there is a little bit of a fallout because of the technology or the tracking. And I think that that's something that, uh, you know, in California, it's kind of the main point right now, um, you know, and not only just cultivators, but in a lot of areas. Um, but when you look at that also in California, I think looking at, say, Canada and you look at what's happening there, right? Sure. Federal, fe federal legalization. Um, and say you're looking at that in the United States, say years down the road, say 2022 or whatever, five years from now, um, is, is, do you think California ends up being the main source of the crop of cannabis for the United States if it were to kind of go in a federally legal way? Or do you think that it still is this kind of federalism and states rights thing that we're seeing that's kind of written into the states act, you know, that that's being proposed right now mm -hmm. um, and allowing these states to kind of uh, do everything as they will and, and on their own. But if you're allowed to cross borders and everything, I feel like California is the player to look at that might supply the, the rest of the country or a lot of it rather. Of course. I mean, you look at Colorado, we have these random banana belts, you know, scattered throughout the, the state in Palisade or Buena Vista or Peonia, you know, some areas where we Rocky Ford, where, where we can actually grow delicious fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, California is a big old banana belt. It's just this amazing land with incredible seaside, uh, uh, you know, terrain, uh, differing, differing altitudes. And in the same way that they grow most of our almonds and avocados and so much of our citrus, I absolutely believe that there is a near future where California is growing a majority of the nation's cannabis. And that's not to say that we won't have these uh, these micro entities um, cultivating in individual states, we will always have that. And they will add necessary, important local flavor to the mix. Um, but, you know, from a sustainability uh, perspective too, I mean, I remember the first time I saw the statistic coming from uh, Excel, which is our local utility here in Colorado. And I think they said 1% of Denver, the city and county of Denver's electrical grid was going to support indoor cultivation facilities. It kind of hurt my heart. And granted, I love the cannabis that comes out of there. But when that cannabis can basically be grown outdoors in Northern California, in Central California, I really believe that we owe it to ourselves and to the environment and to the future and to our kids if we have them to make sure that we're preserving some of that and not just completely blowing out these power grids. Um, and that's certainly, I think, one of the byproducts of this current state versus federal uh, system that we, we, we live in. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And it kind of it, something that you just said made me think of this. And it's when you talked about the the micro businesses and in any sort of state um, or locality, it it reminds me of when people are talking about regulating cannabis like alcohol, right? And and you can make those correlations as you have your large companies who are supplying all over, and then you have your micro brews, right? Um, being able to do this. But uh, you know, I have a, a little bit of a conflict when you say regulate it like alcohol, because there are things that aren't the same as alcohol. Sure. Um, cannabis is, you know, in my opinion, uh, medically beneficial, you 100%, know, hundred and not just in your opinion, the journal of the American medical association, the new England journal of medicine. Yeah. It is medicine. So it is. So it is medicine, and and I think a lot of us don't want it to lose that, and it doesn't need to lose that because it is so powerful. And I think when you end up looking at it um, on a federal level and thinking, okay, are all these people going to come in like they are in Canada, say, and you know, people are investing and and buying people out, you know, kind of somewhat blindly at a point, I would think, um, not all the time. But when you when you look at it that way, and then kind of look at where it will be, do you think that's something where you'll be will be able to maintain that medical value and not just kind of treat it as like a, a micro brew? Um, 
because because that's important and that's something that we need to do. And the reason I think of that is mm-hmm. because it's like if they were to open up advertising or anything and you were to advertise cannabis the way you see alcohol being advertised, you know, where it's sexy, posh nightclubs or twisted tea <laughs> or whatever, you know, uh, it doesn't have that medical kind of value in it. And it's not to say that you can't have fun and enjoy it, uh, you know, recreationally and adult use as, as has been proven. Um, <laughs> but also... I don't think I don't want to lose that that medical edge to it. Uh, do you see any conflict of that happening if something were to happen federally? I don't. I, in fact, I you ask if we can maintain the legitimacy and the and the momentum of medical. And while well, we're seeing a number of things happening on the retail front with sales and what's happened in Washington State with their medical system post adult use. Uh, you know, I think we will absolutely be able to maintain it. And more importantly, we're not going to be able to ignore it. I mean, you look at you look at the data that's coming out and and it's astounding. Uh, we know that we are lied to about this substance, about this plant. And now um, now is the time to- is the information age for cannabis. Really, you know, we've kind of been living in this information age. But unfortunately, there's still in mid 2018 more that we don't know about this plant than what we do. And, and it's thrilling to finally learn more. Uh, just two weeks ago, we saw the fourth top level academic study telling us that cannabis is potentially a legitimate exit drug from far more dangerous and deadly opiates op- and opioids. And that's that's incredible. And as I mentioned earlier, the New England Journal of Medicine published really compelling double-blind, placebo-controlled research from GW Pharmaceuticals about the power of CBD with epilepsy patients. And this is nothing new. We see this in front of our uh, us. I can't imagine how much you guys have seen of this. I've seen some as a as a journalist and a friend and a, and a partner, but it's just compelling when you finally see the science backing it up. The, the Journal of the American Medical Association coming out of 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 decades of silence and and decades of publishing, um, you know, uh, research that points to the potential dangers of cannabis and never the medical efficacy. But suddenly, in the last two three years, there's a lot more research and JAMA coming out telling us, oh, it is legitimate medicine for chronic pain. Oh, it is legitimate medicine for spasticity. Oh, it is legitimate medicine for for nausea and for wasting disease and for our brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles who are who are suffering from cancer. So the momentum is going nowhere. It, this will not be able, you know, nobody will be able to ignore this um, even five years from now. I mean, we're so normalized right now. I get it. Like medical cannabis is less interesting now than it was five years ago. But I think um, it's it's more that we're just desensitized to it. We had this awakening where we recognized the power. And now it's like you keep adding to it. And, you know, from exiting opioids to helping and, and saving lives of epilepsy patients to, you know, the, the multiple sclerosis benefits, sure. which I know is very near and dear to your guys' hearts. It's, it's a wave and we have, we, we, you know, we're not even on the tip of the iceberg yet. I no, think we're, so we're really more. not. In fact, actually, you know what, when you bring up the National MS Society, which we've, you know, worked with for, for quite a few years, um, they just asked us to come down to the National uh, MS uh, 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 event they do uh, once a year. They're having it down in Georgia this year and oh, we're wow. asking us to uh, come and, and provide a presentation, but, no way. Um, which is amazing. You know, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that, uh, that we've worked really hard for, but unfortunately they're sort of going back and forth with the individuals in Georgia right now and saying, this might be too early. Although we, we understand that you guys support it. We just think, and this is, this is that dilemma where, where we're at still, you know, mm-hmm. is that yes, we're there and we live in a place. I mean, pr- I'm, I'm sure that everywhere that you travel to, uh, has a very similar, um, you know, mindset and, and, uh, you know, supports, you know, sort of where you're at. And, um, but there are those places like, like Georgia, um, that, that, you know, are still having a little bit of a conflict, you know, as to whether or not this is something they can talk about like that. Well, I grew up in Georgia. Yes, you did. So, oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, I was First bo- hand. yeah <laughs> born in Toronto, raised in Atlanta. Um, but to what you were saying with that, you know, kind of us maybe being desensitized a little bit. Um, do you think that's maybe just because of what we work in, the field we work in, the things that we're exposed to, and and also kind of the culture and climate um, and it not kind of getting down there yet? 
because I know that I've, it, I know it ha it's not fully down there, but speaking to my parents who have always been very supportive of, of what I do. And, you know, my mom who will now just like preach from the mountaintops, um, uh, you know, about how good cannabis is, you know, for things. But my mom was diagnosed with a child's form of leukemia um, about 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. it's something that only 25 uh, or fifteen percent of people over the age of twenty five get um, diagnosed with this type. She had ninety two percent of her white blood cells were leukemic, and you know she did she wasn't able to use cannabis uh, legally or anything like that to kind of help her. And now when she comes out here and and luckily she's in re remission, uh, she's been in remission for about eight years now, so she has the same chance of falling uh, out of remission as someone who's being diagnosed with leukemia, mm -hmm. which is amazing. She's a right. fighter. But she looks at it and says, I wish I had the access and the information. And I got it through through you, through my son, <laughs> who was doing all this and opened my eyes. And now I kind of preach it from the mountaintops, as I said, down in Georgia. Um, do you think that that desensitized for us uh, that you were talking about was because of the the culture and climate that we work in and the people we know and just kind of how it's more relevant here? Matthew's uh, asking nurture or nature. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I would argue that, yes, yeah, certainly if you work in the industry, there's a certain familiarity that's inescapable. But I think even if you live in Denver and you don't consume and maybe you pass uh, a cannabis dispensary once a week when you're going to church, you know, I think even to that individual, it's it's normalized to a point that is in this. Well, it, it, it's, it's almost it, it's so far from the realm of the mindset from the suburban mom outside of Atlanta or the or the father raising his children in, uh, you know, Atlanta uh, or, or uh, sorry, Austin, Texas, where we have a client. One of our clients uh, just opened the, uh, the first dispensary in, oh, in awesome. Texas, got one of three licenses, and it's CBD only. It's intractable epilepsy only, and the state ledge only every meets only meets every two years. Wow. And so coming up soon, you know, hopefully the state legislature opens up those, uh, that list of medical conditions a little bit. But um, yeah, I think inevitably normalization is real and we see it on so many fronts. And in fact, you know, we talked about the cannabis earlier, my old website. And, um, you know, when I left in December of 2016, we were seven full timers and they tried to keep me it wasn't the right fit for me. And I could see that bad things were happening at the newspaper, which just broke my heart, but I needed to do something else. And less than a year and a half later, there are zero full timers at the cannabis. It's for a lot of reasons, including this awful hedge fund named Alden Global Capital that's just ruining the Denver Post and a hundred other newspapers. But it's also because you know, I wouldn't be surprised if their readership is declining because the interest in cannabis specific news in this market is dying down because it's normal. Normal is kind of boring. I think to even that suburban person who drives past a dispensary once a week and doesn't consume, it's kind of boring. It's like driving past a 7-Eleven. You yep. see them all around and you just kind of just keep on going. You know there's another one down the road if you want to stop, right? And it helps that, you know, the the pandemonium that was promised by the prohibitionists, if I was to get a little bit, uh, what's that called? <laughs> Using, Start preaching. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Get out of your soapbox. I have a, I have a soapbox the right pandemonium <laughs> that was promised by the prohibitionists. <laughs> oh, you know, it never materialized. You know, I, yeah. one of my favorite little quick hits that I wrote at, while I was at the Cannabis in uh, early 2015, I was reading our trees on Reddit and uh, somebody had posted, hey, it was, it's been a year since this happened and it was just a link to a Nancy Grace video on CNN or HLN or something. And, and she, she was just freaking out. She's like, cannabis is legal in Colorado and we're about to see a crime wave of massive proportions and like you've never seen before. And, and, and of course, nothing like that happened. And the what about the children argument? And here we are seeing, you know, Larry Wolk, who is such a great human being, the head of the Colorado Department of Environmental, um, CDPHE, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, he he's the first one to tell you that there has never in the era of recreational or medical cannabis been a statistically significant increase in teen use in Colorado. 
And his counterpart in Washington will tell you the same and same in Oregon and Alaska. And it just keeps going. And sure, the prohibitionists will keep mining that information and they'll find something damning for male 12 year olds in a certain suburb. But, you know, uh, we're looking at top level data. And finally, we have this information at the, as we were talking about earlier. And it's just encouraging because those people have no reason to be afraid anymore. The, the, the person who's driving past a, a shop every once a week. And, and that's exactly what we hoped would happen and exactly what we felt would happen. Do you, do you think that that's uh, kind of being uh, exacerbated or do you think that it's kind of going further now when you look at a country like Canada, you know, le legalizing it, uh, you know, across the entire country? Do you think, you know, in the North Americas, like in the States, you look at that in Canada and that then starts becoming even more normalized because it's being talked about? Without a doubt. Uh, you know, first G7 country to federally legalize, you know, it's the importance of this cannot even be um, weighed right now. Um, uh, I know Ryan knows this. I don't know if you know this, Matthew, but back in 2014, I went down to Uruguay. Oh, um, I, you know, I, I just was like, this is happening somewhere else. I have to go down there. And I knew that they were you know, ahead of us because they were doing it federally, but behind us because implementation was a long way away. And the, the, the president who had legalized it was on his way out of office and they weren't sure who was going to replace him in the next election. But I had to get down there in 2014 to see what was happening. And what happened down there was historic and was him important without a doubt. But that tiny little uh, South American country can't compare to what is about to drop in mid-October up north. And and it's thrilling, uh, uh, especially with like exports and, and all of that madness. But um, yeah, it's just normalizing the conversation even further. I spent much of June up in Canada and Toronto, uh, your hometown, yeah. it sounds like a great city. And also St. John, New Brunswick, speaking at a couple events. And and it was just so telling. But I, but I would also argue that I think Canada has long had a more realistic, reasonable and accurate uh, uh, approach to cannabis than this country has. I would agree with that. And, and, and this is something Ryan and I kind of brought up on a, a earlier podcast, but I'm interested to get your thoughts on it. And when you're looking at kind of regulations, we were talking earlier about kind of the way we're looking at states' rights and the way each state is being able to regulate this. So you look at a, at a country like Canada who is regulating this, and now we're looking at maybe two years until, you know, certain types of concentrates are being able to be produced the way that they're going to roll this out. Do you think that there is a way for a country like the United States uh, or, or, or someone else to to get in there and actually do things a, a little more quickly? Because and, and I'm going to use the United States as an example, because we're kind of the largest example that could sure. kind of go after this. But within all of these states and within different types of extraction that we we allow in these different states and such, um, do you think that there is still a stronghold that we have that if we were to kind of push this federally, um, we could circumvent, you know, a, a major <laughs> global force, like you said, the first of the G7 to be able to do this. But um, because we kind of are watching what they're doing, um, hopefully people in legislation, mm -hmm. they don't always make the right decision. Um, but, right. Ho you know, if they were in a perfect world, do you see that opportunity being viable? Or do you think uh, they're kind of first over that line. So they're going to be kind of first for a while now. I do. I, th I think it's a big if, right? I don't think we're going to federally legalize in this country anytime soon. And it breaks my heart. And I think it's, I think it's sad and unfortunate that we're losing so much thought leadership and, and, and so much of not even a head start, but, but really, you know, to be a pioneer uh, in this space, um, and not me personally, but I'm speaking on behalf of California and Colorado, and and to see them lose that some of that action and some of that stake um, because of what's happening up north, I, I, I do think that's sad. So I think it's a big if, but were something crazy to happen and suddenly Sessions is like, yo, let's do this. <laughs> uh, I, I, I absolutely think that we would have an opportunity to, to, to kind of skip ahead. Um, I had the, the good fortune to learn a lot about Canada's pro own prohibition um, with alcohol and, and how they first implemented legal alcohol sales 
in, in the not so distant past. And, you know, it comes as no surprise. I mean, Canada is a prudish country. They're very cautious. They're very careful. And, and they were insanely careful when they first introduced liquor sales. So this does not surprise me at all that they're just going flower only, uh, slowly dip their feet into the world with edibles and eventually uh, concentrates. And, and it's a shame, but if you pay attention to how they've regulated uh, adult use substances in the past, it's not surprising. And I'm sure if you ask any of them, they'll just say, sorry, or pardon. You know? <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> sorry, man. Sorry, I, man. I, uh, I'm, I'm curious, so with, uh, with you guys opening out in LA now, um, which is, uh, uh, of course, really exciting. And, and uh, again, congratulations. Oh, dude, thank um, you. But uh, with you guys doing that, and obviously in a newer market, I mean, coming from Colorado that we are so cautious about the way in which we do marketing here. Um, what, what, what are you guys sort of doing differently or is it sort of a different concept out there or are you really just sort of, uh, you guys collaborating the same way here? You know, there's a lot of like taking what's worked here and applying it there, especially because they are in that recent post implementation jitters, you know, it's still exciting. It's still new. I was speaking on a, on a cannabis regulations panel in LA a week and a half ago and it was fascinating the excitement that was in the room and i haven't felt that level of excitement uh you know especially around a, a kind of dry subject like regulations yeah. in colorado in a long time so that said grasslands in addition to doing public relations and social and content and thought leadership we also have a really kick-ass uh, events department. And I think that's one area where California has some of the craziest opportunity. Um, you know, I, I have a podcast as well. And I was out in Oakland recording some episodes last week before uh, NCIA's Cannabis Business Summit. And I had some of the Emerald Cup crew on. And I think they've created something really unique and special and gosh, so rooted in sun-grown cultivation culture. And now it's just massive and it's bigger than an ev everything. And from what I can tell, it's the single most legitimate event, cannabis event in, in California. And, and, and that element of, of having consumption friendly areas, whether we're talking about lounges in, in San Francisco, which Barbary coast is beautiful. And I think they have six of those out there. Um, or we're talking about potential restaurant lounges in West Hollywood, or this provision in proposition 64 that actually allows open consumption in the state fairgrounds that, that choose to allow that and choose to be cool with it. I, I, I think that's outstanding because I've seen so many friends and colleagues and clients' businesses in Colorado struggle to throw meaningful events that can connect with a, a target audience, that can connect um, their new product, their, their brand, their ethos, their uh, anything to this uh, desired audience, whether it's bud tenders or the consumer, and, and and just bending over backwards and what's public versus private. And I can't believe we're still having these conversations. And I personally find it appalling that Colorado regulators don't give a fuck. They don't give a shit about public consumption. They do not see it in 2008 as a, 18 as even an issue. Um, I know they didn't see it as an issue in 2014 because I was talking <laughs> with them off the record at the time. And they're like, Oh, so that's a problem. And I was like, well, you're selling it to anybody 21 and over and where are they going to consume it? Um, but it's very clear in 2018 that they still don't care. And I, we're about to just be passed up at meteoric light speed by California and very, very quickly Nevada. And, yeah. and I think it's, I think it's a shame. I think, it, but, but I, but as a, as a marketer and as a public relations person, and certainly as a journalist still, because uh, anybody listening, I, I have a column in every issue of MG magazine and cannabis now and Sensi magazine. And I still cover cannabis for the daily beast. Um, as a journalist, I very much think that the California market presents such a unique opportunity. And, and there's no way in hell I cannot not be a part of it. I need to get in there. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny because I'd, I'd be curious what you guys think. But like two weeks ago, I was like, I told my staff, I was like, yeah, we're going to open an office in California. We're hiring for these two positions, a publicist and a content specialist. If anybody out there is listening, check us out at mygrasslands.com. Um, but you know, I was like, 
we're going to open these up in Hiram in California. And everybody's eyes lit up and they're like, okay, where are we going? I have a great staff of eight people, really, really hard workers. I was like, oh, well, I think East Bay. I think the North, you know, we can't afford San Francisco. We can't really afford the East Bay, but we'll make it work. And then I went to LA and and I came back and I was like, hey, surprise, we're going to Southern California now. But uh, I, I can't wait to dig in. I'm going to spend a week out there every month, if not more. Same with my business partner. And I'm so jazzed to, to kind of take advantage of those differences in the regulatory environment. Oh, that's great. I mean, well, and then what about uh, just to even throw it uh, further? What about Texas? I mean, is that just a completely different uh, conceptual. And I think what I'm really trying to get at here is, is, you know, understanding all the things that you can do for these businesses out there yeah. and, uh, how, how versatile you guys really are. Uh, thanks. You know, I appreciate the opportunity and, and, you know, we, the, I think all of these regulatory environments have forced us to really hone our earned media efforts. Um, and I kind of split that into two categories. You have traditional PR, which gets the word out, which tells people about the interesting things that you're doing, um, about your unique perspectives. Um, and then we also do the thought leadership content side where we ideate with our clients about what's most important to them. And then we throw that at the news cycle and see what's happening right then and see what's happening in the outlets, mainstream, B2B, trades, whatever, um, whatever gets to your target audience. And then we help you write a piece that is very much tied into the current news cycle that we think we can place in a top outlet, whether that's, uh, you know, cannabis business executive, uh, Huffington Post. We just placed two pieces last week, one in International Business Times and the other in Entrepreneur. Um, and so, so these are all earned media opportunities. And because of this lack of advertising, a lot of these businesses are instead of uh, throwing, you know, thousands of dollars at Facebook or Instagram every, every week, they're throwing thousands of dollars at us and, and we're taking their message and getting it heard. And for example, you know, uh, our Texas client, Compassionate Cultivation, a really great company based just south of Austin in Mancheck. And uh, last week, it made headlines when the DEA raided a vape shop, I believe in Amarillo, and they were just selling CBD. And, and, and they got raided. And, and I just dropped a line to my colleagues in the PR department with a link. And I was like, please check in with our colleagues <laughs> in Texas and see if they'd like to comment on this. And, and they did. And, and we worked with them to create a statement. And less than an hour, it was at every uh, media outlet in Texas. And we've had tremendous wins with them. Uh, the cover of the Austin American Statesman, the cover of the, uh, the Big Weekly in Austin, uh, the cover of the Dallas Morning News. And, and we're working on further that message and and it helps that they're a great player they're really passionate about the community um, meds are expensive CBD is expensive and so they created a program that um, they sell merch now and a proportion of those proceeds go toward a fund that will help um, you know their patients get the medicine that they need um, so so yeah I think it really does force you to get creative with earned media and thankfully I brought on a business my business partner Shauna McGregor about five uh, months ago, and she really is a whiz at PR, and her PR brain plus my journalism brain—it's just kind of a special thing that's happening in our offices these days. So, no, I, man, I've said this before, but I mean, you guys legitimately have an all-star uh, all-star crew. I mean, it's uh, uh, you know people that I've now known for for years and years and respected uh, greatly. So, you know, hats off that you guys have been Thank able you. to do what you've done so far. So, it, uh, it, it really speaks to I, I ask people the question when they come on as a guest or, you know, ask Ryan every month, depending on what sense, you know, we're working on. And right now we were talking about the the sense of hearing and I was going to ask you kind of what that means to you, but I don't have to ask you just because of the way that you spoke about it with your passion and what you're doing and what your team and what everyone's doing. And uh, like you just said, being able to look at the advertising and being able to get like their voices out into all of these mediums, um, into all these different publications and have them be heard. And I think that's such an amazing thing that you've been able to do for so long and grow up until now uh, with Grasslands. So um, mygrasslands.com, everybody check that out. And what's the name of your podcast, Ricardo? Uh, the podcast is called Cannabis and Maine. Cannabis. And, and Matthew, I only want to add one more thing to what you just said, yeah. because I think I don't know. I find that we we've lost a certain quality, um, a certain basic quality that ties directly into hearing, and that's listening. 
you know, you can hear, but not listen. And I think too often, um, too often we're in conversations and we don't listen, we don't even listen to each other, whether it's our colleagues or our clients or, you know, or our, our boss, whatever, whatever that looks like. So I love that you guys are breaking it down by the senses because I don't know, I, I literally tell my staff at least once a month and there's always a situation inspiring it, but it's like, we need to listen. It's our job to listen to our clients in a different way than other agencies, other professionals do. And, 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 I, and I think they take notice. And certainly in our personal relationships, it's the same. So as we talk about hearing, I would ask anybody listening to this podcast to be cognizant about also listening and responding and, and respecting what's being said and, and, and going from there. Listen and join the conversation. That's why I love this medium. I love podcasting so much. I, it's like sitting down with friends, having a conversation. We don't have our phones out. We, this thing, we're, we're just sitting around looking at each other, talking yeah. and having the conversation, like making an hour, you know, um, which a lot of people don't even do when they go out to lunch with their friends, you know, because they constantly have a screen in, fr in front mm -hmm. of it. So I, I love this medium and, and being able to have that outlet and be able to have these conversations. I think it's a great thing. So um, there is one question before before we kind of tail off here that I had to ask. Uh -oh. um, it, it's not that horrible, but it, it, it might hit a little close to home. And it's uh, with the cannabis and with uh, that hedge fund coming in. And I don't know all of the specifics, but, you know, when they talk about the bots running it, right? And we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, looking at, or, you know, sending out information um, on both sides and, and reporting unbiasedly and things like that. How do you feel about that when it's these bots? Are they just going off of tags? And so you put in these certain tags, so you're going to get these certain articles and other things aren't going to get through. I mean, with grasslands, it seems like you kind of know how how to get these things out. Uh, do the bots have anything to do with that? Do you think it's hurting? And, and, and also general? just for a friend, uh, what is a bot? <laughs> not I I'm aware obviously I just <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know oh man so so much was made about when they first announced that the cannabis was going unstaffed and then uh, it got out on a Twitter feed I think it was my former colleague Jake Brown who who runs the grow off which I know you guys are familiar with in yep. this in these ha hallowed <laughs> halls as I'm surrounded by awards but uh, you know I, I think he he kind of let the let the um, let the news out that that it was going to be run by bots and you know bots pretty simple it's just a robot that's like doing as it's programmed to do so it's like all right if if these are tagged or certain way or put into a certain category then it will automatically self-produce on the site and for an example like when I left uh, December 2016 staff of seven we were full four editorial three uh, sales side um, so they were selling the site. We were creating the site every day. And, and that involved not only writing original stories, but perusing the wires and making sure what we wanted to produce. And, and then also producing those stories as humans who weren't just taking the, the headline that was automatically attributed to it on the Washington Post wire or the AP um, and, and reformulating that headline so it better fit our aesthetic as the cannabis, um, picking the right art. Uh, to go with the art meaning photos, uh, you know, bots don't have, you know, it's AI. And, and then again, it's, it's newspaper AR, AI. So it's really rudimentary and cheap. <laughs> and so, you know, when you look at the cannabis now, it just doesn't have that personalized feel as it did when a human was producing it, when a human was writing it. And I, and I think it's, I think it's devastating for what the cannabis was and it's, and inevitably I'm sure that it's losing readership. I know that it's losing authority. Um, and, and it, and it really is a tragic, um, thing that's happened, uh, to, to, to journalism. I mean, it kind of was that, that stand, it, it stood out in a, in an era where, High Times was out there constantly reporting the good, you know, and, and, and just never holding industry accountable because that's not what they do. They're the, they're the drug warriors and they want to make this right. And everything they will write will put the plant in the best possible light. And then you had the, the mainstream media for past decades um, repeating so much prohibitionist rhetoric just because the federal government was repeating it. And that's you know, traditionally a, an authoritative source. And so we kind of took this middle ground and thankfully you do have other sites now that are taking that middle ground, but 
you know, journalism is under attack in this country. Cannabis journalism is also under attack in this country, in part because of, uh, you know, greedy hedge funds and owners who don't believe in the content or the future of such a vertical, uh, in part because uh, a, a lot of reasons. But um, uh, yeah, it definitely it definitely broke my heart. And 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 now I feel like I'm just meandering, and I forgot the exact point of your question. <laughs> I, I I think you actually yeah. answered it. All it was all encompassing. I the, the yeah. So thank you so much. And um, thanks for answering that for my friend. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, before we get out of here, I do have one more thing uh, that we do here. It's a it's a little bit of a segment that we call what you talking about and uh oh, we, yeah where's the theme music <laughs> yeah <laughs> we just go around and we talk about uh what we're talking about nowadays you know it could be uh today yesterday this week this month you know kind of what's your favorite flavor so ricardo i'll let you uh start it off here what you talking about ricardo oh man i'll start us off but i want another try after we go yeah around all right. we'll, we'll, we'll start we'll and finish we'll with you to. and so let me okay and this is a theory i have and i need to bounce it off you guys because you know, we're Colorado, right? But we're experienced in other states and every state has its own aesthetic and feels and, and, and certainly no one can hold a candle to the history that California brings to this, this culture. It's immense. It's so cool. I love the heads. I love how serious they are. You know, get, get some head out of like NorCal talking about sun grown. <laughs> and like two hours later, you're just like, mind is blown. Um, but but one thing that's really surprised me about the California consumer is how much they love the fruit, how much they love the citrus, the the Skittles and the and and what was like, I, I got some Mac when I was there last week, uh, Frenchie Cannoli. I was talking with oh, him yeah, and he yeah. gave me some Mac flour. I was like, what's Mac? And he, I, I took it off and oh my God, it just filled my olfactory with just the most spectacular Fruit Loops. And then I, I, I let another friend smell it and he's like, oh, have you tried, uh, have you tried uh, mimosa? And I was like, no, I love mimosas, but I have not tried the strain mimosas. And then when I was in LA before, earlier in that week, um, I, w- I was on a panel with Sherbinsky, okay. you know, the cre- yeah, yeah, for I sure. guess the creator of Sherbert, a, a great, talented, passionate dude, total industry leader, mad love, mad respect. And Sherbert, man, more fruit. So it's like, it's so funny because I don't I don't think the California market is obsessed with is as obsessed with this citrus this fruit these sweet the tang as as california is does that make sense to you guys i you know it's it's interesting though because i mean california at least to to me like the the underground culture for so long was was the ogs the cushes you know i mean where um they almost didn't i mean they would scoff at something that had uh uh, you know, had some flavor to it like that. And, and, you know, I mean, versus, you know, the East Coast going to the complete opposite end that was so diesily and, uh, you know, for, for quite some time. And I mean, uh, AJ has something to do with that. But uh, but either <laughs> but either way, like, I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, I think that, that you had these really polar opposites as to, you know, what people were looking for. And so it is really interesting now to hear you say that, you know, only because I feel like, I mean, the, the whole thing is evolving, right? And, and, and uh, uh, you, by the way, hang out with some very interesting interesting, fun people. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's cool that you get to try, you know, some of these, uh, incredible strains and, and really know what's coming next. I, so I would say, keep your eye out when you're in California, because this is something that, uh, the lab director here for the lab, uh, Kim Eastman and I, we've been out working in California and there was one strain that caught us and it does have kind of that fruitiness. And both of us were kind of blown away. And I also love the name. So I'm going to talk about it right now. Okay. Rosé Parfait. <laughs> and I don't know the exact cross on it, but I, I, I spoke to the farmer um, at, at the time that I tasted it. And um, I mean, just the smell of the fruit. And it wasn't just citrusy. Um, it was also kind of like that rounded, almost like like berries, mm-hmm. you know, um, that, that little bit in there. And um, I would say just keep your eye out for that Rosé Parfait because it was definitely one of my favorites and one of Kim's favorites as well. Oh, well, I, you know, and now that you guys, you know, are, are talking so much about sun grown, I was, uh, I've been out in Oregon for a little while here, you know, the, uh, the yeah. lab actually just, uh, just opened in, in Oregon. So we're excited about, uh, being out there, um, and having a chance to go to some of these farms is, is just, uh, like you said, it's, it's just the magical, you know, component of, of cannabis. And it's like, it's really what we're missing. I feel like it's, uh, it's kind of sad that we trap it up in these warehouses, 
Um, and, uh, you know, but, but going but we're out, forced to. we're yeah. forced to, but, uh, but still you go out to places like Oregon and California and, you know, really the, the West coast in general that, um, that have an opportunity to put this product outside. And, um, you know, it, uh, it was, it was so fun to go out there and, and check out some of those incredible, um, flavors. And I know there's been that debate for so long and, you know, I've been a part of it that, uh, you know, indoor versus outdoor product and, and, uh, you know, obviously you can, you can from a mile away identify you know outdoor product as as inferior um i would tell people to back up on that uh mm-hmm. and be real careful what they say there's some there's pretty, an army behind that well and there's some pretty amazing product out there that these guys are growing so um you know i i guess uh the the, the one i saw though it's you know i think uh flower that you guys have definitely probably seen out here but awesome specimen of of uh, alien og um, oh, no. that, uh, soul sisters was growing out in Oregon. Um, uh, it was just super flavorful. Um, uh, really it just triked out like you, like you had not seen before. I mean, really looked like, uh, if you're familiar with grape Godbud that we've been growing for a long time, um, really more of a, a stout, uh, type, uh, type plant, but just, um, you know, down to the end of every single fan leaf. I mean, this thing is, is, uh, you know, is completely, see, uh, and you got, out. you got to see it actually being grown. I got to do some extractions with it. Yeah, for <laughs> so, sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, that's, that's, what's interesting though. I think in, and I will say this, I mean, Hey, when, when, uh, when there's credit to give, I, I will do so, but, but I will also, uh, you know, deliver my, my real opinion too. And I, I think I, I opened a lot of those jars and through a lot of these different dispensaries out there, an incredible smelling, you know, product uh, looked really great. Um, but a lot of the flavors kind of fell a little bit flat. And I think, you know, that's mostly, I would guess, you know, when you're drying and curing as much as they are, uh, at the, that's, that's a difficult thing to be able to put that sort of craft, um, touch that we are able to do, uh, because of warehouses and because of smaller, you know, crops than, than what these guys are growing. So, sure. um, so there's, you know, there's some good and some bad, but I mean, but it was, uh, uh, still such a, such an awesome opportunity to go out there and see some of that. So, and uh, speaking of underwhelming, bud, uh, you know, I mean, poor California right now, post July 1st, it's not your fault, California. We know you're going to bounce <laughs> back from this, but you know what's on shelves right now, especially the flowers, just hurting, hurting. You know, it just went to a, a good sample in northern and southern. Um, but but in terms of me personally, let me tell you what I'm enjoying. Yeah. And and one I'll go with the, with the house uh, because you guys do great products, and and your Tangy Pax Pod is magic. <laughs> Thank you guys both for the Tangy Pax Pod. I have made you so many customers. Just by like, try this, and they're like, oh, okay, where can I go get that? I'm like, it's easy. <laughs> they have seven or eight locations. But, but but in addition to that, I was I was playing golf at the Evergreen Golf Course a couple weeks ago with some buddies, and I had a California cartridge in my pocket, and you know we were enjoying ourselves barefoot and enjoying that crazy course and a buddy of mine pulled out a willie's reserve pen uh which i believe is distillate and uh, i hit that on like fifth or sixth hole and and next thing you know like i was in the stratosphere which is pretty (laughs) rare for a vape pen you know right but oh my god i promise you two days later i was at live well buying a freaking willie's reserve (laughs) pen which i never had before and 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 i'm a customer i really enjoy that pen it just kind of like it, it just kind of clicks it, and it, and it's kind of like, unlike any other oil I've, I've ever had out of a preloaded cartridge. Do they do, is it naturally derived terpenes then uh, added back in or what, I mean, was it flavored or was it uh, cannabis flavor? Uh, it was strain specific okay. and I don't know uh, where the chirps came from, okay. whether they were botanical or, or cannabis oh, derived. That's cool. But I'll have to check those out. Yeah. <laughs> highly recommend it. For sure. Definitely. Well, Ricardo, thank you so much for for taking the time to come down here and come to the studio and be with us on Elevated Culture. We really appreciate it. Is there anything else you want to want to talk about? Any websites, uh, your Twitter? I love your Twitter Twitter handle, by the way, uh, at Bruvs. <laughs> um, everyone check that out. Uh, but is there anything else that you want to, you know, say other than mygrasslands.com? Uh, anything else you want to throw out there? Nah, I want to shout out to you guys for doing the good work. You know, uh, this is this this is not an easy game. Um, mad respect to you guys. And, and also to create a marketing initiative like a podcast. You know, I know how much work these things are. So so props. And yeah, follow me on Twitter and Insta at Bruvs, B-R-U-V-S. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate that and appreciate your time. 
Ryan, do you have anything else before we no, uh, just, get out uh, of here? No, just again, thank you very much for uh, for coming in here. You uh, you just can probably double the amount of uh, listeners that we have, so uh, I seriously appreciate it. But uh, definitely check Ricardo out. He's uh, he's a, a, an amazing guy that I've had an opportunity to know for quite some time now, and uh, very impressed with uh, with where Grasslands is headed. And um, you know, stay tuned. I guarantee you're going to see bigger things. So um, so thank you very much for coming in today. And uh, Matthew, as always, hats off. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for being here as always, Ryan and uh, everyone listening. Please tell your friends, feel free to follow us on Facebook. Uh, Just search for the clinic. Feel free to follow us on Instagram, uh, the clinic underscore Colorado. Um, you can feel free to send us emails at elevated culture podcast at the clinic, And, uh, besides that, we will see you in a couple of weeks and thank you for listening. And always remember elevate your culture. Culture. culture.